Okay, guys. So it is 830. I'm sure that people are going to start uh, strolling on in, but um, I am a stickler for starting on time and ending on time. So I have uh, 25 minutes. And in today's training, I wanted to go over the seven communication techniques that you should be using on every call, right? Um, now, as I was preparing for this training, wow, I started at five. So the emails that you guys got, said, hey, the five communication techniques. And then as I was preparing for this, it turned into seven. And then now I think I'm at 11. So my goal is to get through the core things that I had intent. But because this is advanced role playing training, my focus is to start helping you guys uh, work on rebuttaling some of the challenges that you guys are having with the objections that you're getting. So I'm gonna go through this now. I think I'm live on Facebook. So before I do that, let me just make sure that that feed is going, because that would be awkward. Um, yeah, I think it is. All right, guys. So first, before we dive too far into things, we need to set a precedence. We need to understand something. And if you've been following me for a while, or if you've been to some of my trainings, I often say that your brain is a computer. And like a computer, it has predictable responses, right? So if you look at a computer and you understand a computer, uh, a computer system has languages. Uh, if you speak to it in the wrong language, nothing's gonna happen. No different than if we talk to somebody else in a different language, nothing's gonna happen. Um, but, it's, but it's predictable in as such that computers also have input devices and they have output devices. And so it's predictable because if you input certain things, you can predict an outcome on this, right? And your brain is the most advanced computer on the planet, regardless how smart you are um, or feel that you are. Uh, the processing power is immense, but there are communication patterns that you can predict an outcome. And really, really good salespeople, they do these techniques anyways. But what I want you guys to understand is that when you understand the fundamentals of it, if you, when you understand the science behind it, you can now use that technique. And, you, and of course, uh, you never get good at anything without practice. But if you use those techniques uh, uh, and you understand them, now you're able to implement them uh, whenever you want, right? And you know, Anthony Robbins says that sales is manipulation. And you can use your superpower of manipulation for good and you can use it for evil, right? We all know those salespeople that are, you know, salesy, that they're, you know, the, the quintessential uh, used car salesman. They're in every single profession. I choose to use my, my uh, superpower for good, um, and I don't like taking advantage of people, but uh, you, you most definitely could do that. So with that being said, I do want to remind you, and you guys have heard me say this time and time again, the person who asks the questions controls the conversation. So you really, really need to focus. Rookie salespeople, they, they tell, they don't sell. They learn something new and they just want to share it with everybody, right? That's not what you want to do. Every seller, every buyer, every consumer, they have a belief pattern. You are, there is nothing that you're going to say that they haven't heard before that is going to interrupt their belief pattern. The only way that you can actually change someone's belief is by asking them a question, leading them down a path so that they come to that conclusion themselves. And these are the techniques that I'm going to share with you um, that could help you facilitate that. In a sense, I, I think of if any of you have ever gone river rafting, I've gone river rafting. It's a blast. It's scary. Uh, when you go down a river once, you never go down the same path the same way. Yes, the, the, the start and the end point are the same, but the way you get down there, if you get down there, you might topple, um, is going to be different, right? And so that's where the communication pattern comes in. And that's where the answer asking questions comes in is that you have a start and you have a finish of a conversation. That's your talk track. So you guys hear me talk about a talk track. The goal here is to, you know, like herding sheep, take the, the, the person you're talking to down to a path to a point where you're either going to continue the conversation or you're going to end the conversation. Either one's fine, right? So let's talk about that. 
So for those of you who are just uh, joining in on Facebook and in the group, uh, I was sharing that I initially started out with seven communication techniques, uh, five communication techniques. Uh, as I was preparing for this, it turned into seven. Now I'm not at 11. Um, so I'm going to get through it. I do have a hard stop at 8.55 for a meeting at nine. But uh, if I don't get through everything here, I definitely want to get to a point where you guys have some time to ask questions and we can role play out some different objection handling scenarios because this is advanced role playing or advanced objection handling training. So let's talk about this. Number one, seven, the seven communication techniques. Number one, I feel like Johnny Carson. Number one, the assumptive opening. Huge, huge. This is the one I use most office. Now, for those of you that are coming in uh, from Keller Williams Irvine, and, I, and I'm fairly new to this role, um, you guys will notice that when I talk to you, when I, if the ones that I've called and, and have engaged with, I assume that when you answer the phone, I'm talking to you. So I'll answer the phone, uh, or I'll, when the phone gets answered, they say, hello. I'm like, yeah, hi, John. And they're like, there's only three possible outcomes to that. Number one, is that they're going to say, yeah, that's the most common answer, right? Again, predictable response. Uh, when you say, hey, yeah, John, uh, yeah. Okay, now I know it's John. Now I continue with my conversation. Or you're going to get, I'm going to say, hi, yeah, John. And they're going to say, who? Right? They're going to have that, that tonality and they're going to like, who? Who are you trying to reach? You know that you have the wrong number, right? Um, that is the most common response. Like 90% of the time, you're, that's what you're going to get when you have the wrong number, when, you, when the assumptive opening is wrong, right? Uh, or you're going to get, who are you trying, or uh, who's this, right? Those are the only three options. Now, someone's going to come up with a fourth, and when you do come up with a fourth, please let me know, because those are the only three that I have uh, come up with in the time that I can really, really start thinking past. Um, but if they say, who is this, you know it's them, right? Because they are screening their own call. They want to know if you're going to try and sell them something. We all do it, right? We all want to know who we're talking to, which leads me into number 12 that I need to add to this, okay? There are um, two things that you have to understand when you're calling somebody. When somebody's calling you, you do the same thing. Number one, if it's an unidentified number, they want to know who's calling them. That's their first objective. You see a phone number, they're like, yeah. Who's calling me, right? Everybody has caller ID. Caller ID changed the way that telephone prospecting and follow-up works because everybody screens their calls. You guys do it. I do it. I do it to like the 10th degree. Um, so I assume that everybody else does it. So who is it? And then the next thing is once they identify who it is, what do they want, right? Those are the two things. So that's, that's going to go on my, my list um, of this uh, slide deck. So when I, when I do it again, uh, it won't be the seven techniques or communication techniques. It's going to be like the 12. Who knows? Next year, it's going to be like 20. Um, so you need to understand that. And then, uh, so accept that. That's how it goes. That's how the mindset works. Be prepared for it because it's going to happen. So you can practice that. The assumptive opening. Always know who you're calling. Don't call cold. If someone says, uh, um, you know, wrong number or who is this? Uh, assume that it's them and just go into your, your uh, talk track. Number two, pattern interrupts. Uh, pattern interrupts, you, we've all been on the same phone call where people just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And you want to shoot yourself. Um, a pattern interrupt is something that you say or do that will interrupt their process of thought, right? So you, you do something. And I'm going to tell you guys the ultimate pattern interrupt that works like a charm. Uh, you do something that interrupts the person <clears throat> so that you can actually regain control of the conversation. Now, yesterday, I actually had a vendor call me. Um, and I'm, I've been pretty busy lately. And I, I love talking to vendors. I love talking to agents. Uh, I don't love hearing life story when I'm, when I'm busy. I'm sure you guys can all relate. So what I did is I hung up on him. That's the ultimate power interrupt because we're all on cell phones. It is not uncommon for a line to drop, right? It's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for us to lose cell tower. So what I do is I hang up 
And I, I called them back and my gosh, you know, I, I really don't know what happened. Um, hey, but what we were talking about is this, that, and the other. And so, and then I regain control of the conversation. Now you don't have to go that crazy. I mean, that's the extreme. You can do things, something very abrupt, uh, uh, you know, say, you know, say that again. Oh gosh, you know, I didn't, didn't really hear you. And you know what? I really don't want to get off track. Um, you know, what I was wondering was, and then ask your question, right? So there's a variety of different pattern interrupts. The ultimate one is if you, if you've lost control and you can't get off it, just hang up. They'll call you. If you wait long enough, they'll call you back. Um, but if it's a prospecting call, uh, you call them back. You might go to voicemail, um, leave a voicemail, and then just continue following up. Uh, number three, use filler language. Now, filler language, uh, a lot of sales trainers uh, don't agree with me on this, is the us, it's the ums, it's the you knows. The reason why I say that you use filler language is that you need to use it strategically. Don't use it unconsciously. You have to make sure that you eliminate the filler language unconsciously so that you can input the filler language consciously because when you use it unconsciously, you use it way too much and you sound like you don't know what you're talking about. And a lot of people do that when they're nervous. But when you use it consciously, you're going to you're going to build rapport faster because you're talking in the communication pattern that everybody talks in, right? If you're talking with your best friend or a relative, you're using ums, you knows, and, and, and such, right? So, um, but you're not using it to, uncon well, you are using it unconsciously, but you're not using it a whole lot because you're not nervous, right? You already know them, you already have rapport. So the more rapport you have, the more comfortable you are, the less that you're going to use it unconsciously, but just keep focused that, it's a, it's a language pattern. If you don't use it, you sound scripted. You sound robotic, right? If all I did was, and, and if you guys really think about the way I'm listening, and this is being recorded, you can go back and listen to it. I use filler language when I do these presentations, when I do these trainings, when I do talk to people, I don't use it a lot. You know, it takes, it, it took some time to train your mind to be conscious of not using it. And I can do it pretty well now. Okay, so there's that. Uh, Number four, strategic pauses. Don't just run through what you're saying. You have to pause. Pausing gives drama. See, I just did it. Just pause. And if you pause after a question, what's going to happen to the other person? Remember, predictable responses. If you <coughs> a question and you just don't say anything, the subconscious of the other person, they're like, Oh my God, they just asked me a question. I need to say something. It's my turn to talk. And if you wait long enough, they're going to say something because they're going to get uncomfortable. You're going to get uncomfortable too, but you're the one who's initiating it on purpose. So um, make it fun. Look at your watch. Ask your question. Don't say anything. Accept the fact that the next person who answers a who asks a who talks loses. And just sit there. And I guarantee that within three to five seconds, they're going to say something. They're going to either answer your question or they're going to say that, uh, ask you to repeat the question, which means they weren't listening to you and you want them. So you got to keep them engaged. Number five, softeners. You guys hear me say about this. Uh, other trainers, other people use these, uh, have different terms for these. I call it a softener because it lessens the blow of the next thing I'm going to say. Um, some of the things that I do is, Hey, if you don't mind me asking, or hey, while I have you on the phone, I give them a purpose on why I'm asking the next question, right? I was talking to <coughs> yesterday, someone who, were, uh, who I set an appointment with, and uh, not, not a whole big of a producer, and you know, it seemed like they just knew everything, right? And, and I'm like, you know, um, don't get mad at me, and if you don't mind me asking, or is it okay if I talk to you from a business perspective, right? So I'm, I'm reframing the conversation and I'm lessening the blow, right? And my next thing was, if you're doing all of these things, why are you only closing three and a half transactions in the last 12 months? You should be doing 12 to 15. So if you're doing all of that, why is it not working, right? And then I just, you know, does a lot of business out of state. Um, 
That's uh, five. Number six, tempo. And number seven goes with it to tonality of speech. Can you Here's the please thing, guys. ask somebody to, can you please ask to make their microphone? You know what? Actually, yes. I'm going to mute everyone. Microphone, Thank you for please. Up, Katya. Can you okay. ask, there is somebody that is doing their dishes or whatever. Can you please ask them to, to put the microphone off? No, I'm just going to mute everybody. And if you guys want to talk, you. press Thank hold, you. Down the, um, hold down the space button or just unmute yourself. But I'm going to mute all you guys. There we go. Boom. That's power. Zip it. See, stop. Um, that's the ultimate pattern interrupt, right? You have the mute button. Okay, so um, the next thing. So here's the addition. So tempo of speech, tonality of speech. Naturally, we do not talk in the same rate of speech, right? We do not talk at the same rate of speech. It's natural. It's our communication patterns that when you are talking, every sentence is speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. But on the same level, and this is the last one, you're always, your pitch is changing as well. Your tonality is changing as well. When your voice goes deeper and slower, things are getting real, right? Pause, drama. But when your voice is higher and going faster, it's more exciting, there's more energy, right? So um, make sure that when you guys are practicing that, you guys are practicing the rate of speech and you guys are practicing adjusting your tonality because that's going to change things for you. Now, how much time do I have? Time check, 847. Okay, let me hammer through these other ones. Uh, and then I'm going to give you examples. Embedded commands, we're gonna be talking about that in this example that I'm gonna be giving you. Uh, deflection, uh, afflection, so an embedded command is you embedding, it's exactly what it is, you're embedding something into their mind to let their subconscious prospect to, to process it, right? I'm, I have an example for you guys, we're gonna role play it out. Deflection. Deflection is when you're, now it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but what you want to do is you want to bank something off the wall and hit them. Now the outcome is the same, but they're receiving it isn't so intrusive, right? So what I do on this is most homeowners, uh, most people, uh, a lot of people, a lot of agents, most agents, Right, I'm baking it off the wall. Now we're only having one-on-one -on -one conversation. So if you're talking to a seller and I say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, hey, most homeowners who are looking to sell their home want to sell their home for, for uh, in the quickest amount of time and for top dollar. Are you like most homeowners? It's so much more or less intrusive than saying, do you want to sell your home for the most money and in the quickest amount of time? Guys, we are getting hit. Right. I mean, just from the time, if you guys opened up your Facebook feed or your email before you guys got on this call, you guys were already hit with a dozen probably sales messages, right? We need to make these uh, a communication and we need to try to get away from traditional activities that make you appear salesy. Because when you appear salesy, uh, that, that, that natural barrier that you try to get through to build rapport becomes thicker, right? Okay, so that's what deflection is. You bounce things off the wall. Uh, assumptive closes. Uh, assumptive closes are when you just assume that something is right. It might not rewrite. So a lot of things that you guys will hear me say is after I say something, I'll shake my head and I'll say right in the form of a question. And you guys might not agree with me, but I would say something, I'm like, okay, right? And then you would naturally go right. I like doing the things on Zoom. I was doing the Zoom for in like 2006. Um, it's the it's the next bear. It's the it's the next closest thing to having an in person meeting. It's really hard to get a cold contact to do a physical meeting with that, with you. It's a lot easier to get them to do a midpoint. So uh, it allows me to do the yes moments and 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 such. But it works well on. Uh, just vocal communication too. Uh, the last one, using humor. Um, peep, see, uh, filler language. People will engage in your content if it's informational, that suits their purpose, or entertaining, right? 
really, really great presenters, really, really great salespeople are a combination of both, right? Humor eases people. Guys, we're selling people's houses and we're selling people's houses in a very serious time. Uh, you need to, to use some humor to bring the, the seriousness down a little bit. You know, so just throw in some jokes. Um, that is number 12. Wait, eight, nine, 10, 11. So that was 11. Um, the other one, the 12 one that I'm going to be adding is, is um, what was it? What was it? I'll go back. My alert came up. I got taken off guard. Okay, guys. So those are the 11 things. Now I, I want to role play this out. So today's objection in the, in the group that we're working on is um, we want to wait until COVID passes. So I want to work on that. We've been working on this for like five months and we, this is still the most common objection that people say that they get that they need to work on. I do this with agents face to face. I do this on the phone. Like I feel like I'm Yoda when it comes to this objection because I'm working on it so much. And I hope that you guys feel like you're Yoda too, because you guys are working on it so much. Because again, you never get good at something unless you practice. And the more you practice, the better you get. It's true on everything. It doesn't matter what you do. So who wants to role play with me? There's four people with their camera on. Katya, you want to role play with me? Cecilia, you, you, your game? Cecilia raised your yes. hand. But I don't know, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So let's do this. So give me the objection. We want to wait until COVID passes. Um, we want, uh, who, me? Yeah, give it to me. Or the other girl. Okay. It doesn't matter, but you guys okay. both can kind of chime in. Okay, Brett, we want to wait until COVID passes. We're very nervous about the whole thing. Okay. All right, so Cecilia, I totally understand that you wanna wait until it's safe to sell your home, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So Sorry, look- Sorry, there's a plane going in and going on. But yes, we're very, we're very skeptical. I don't want people coming in and out of the house and I don't know if they are infected. Sure. I, I don't know also what's going to go. Yeah. You don't want people going through the house infected. You don't, you, you want to keep your family safe, right? Yes. Yeah. I totally get it. So I totally understand that you want to wait until it's safe to sell your home. I get it. And that's the goal here, right? So it's safe. Yes. Okay. So guys, there's two techniques I did there. Number one is I did a level shift. The objection is they want to wait until COVID passes. Uh, a level shift is when you change that object in it. I, I don't, I don't want to, I can't deal with the objection, wait until COVID passes. I'm not a scientist. I don't know when COVID's going to pass. That could be never, you know, and that's part of this script. So I'll wait until we get into that. But I can deal with the fact that you want to wait until it's safe to sell your home, right? So I acknowledged you, Cecilia, and then I level shift you from, I wanted to wait until COVID passes to uh, you want to wait until it's safe to sell your home. And then I did a, an assumptive close. I said, right, right. She wanted to wait until COVID passes. The underlying is what most homers deflection. I could have used this deflection is that most homeowners just want to, it's, it's not about waiting until COVID passes. The underlying reason is waiting is making sure that your family is safe. Cause the last thing you want to do is sell your house. And your family's dead. That doesn't, that doesn't serve any purpose, right? Humor. I can't see anyone. So I don't even know if anyone's laughing. I'm laughing. <laughs> um, okay. So T Katya, you're going to take the next one. So, okay, Katya. So great. So then we're definitely in alignment on the fact uh, on that, right? It has to be safe. So Katya, if you don't, oh, I just came up with number 13. Number 13. Science has proven that when somebody hears their own name, dopamine spikes in the brain, which means that the more you use somebody's name, the more happy they get. They like hearing their own name. So if you know that, you can in in do that. So Katya, if you don't mind me asking, okay, that, that's a, a softener. Most sellers, deflection, 
Most sellers want to sell their home for top dollar in the fastest amount of time. Would you say that is your goal as well? Absolutely, Brett. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I mean, we don't want to sell it in the slowest amount of time for the least amount of money, right? Right. Okay. You and I are on the same page. Humor. A seller would have laughed at that because it's so absurd that nobody wants to sell their, that nobody, well, except those people who list their price. Uh, if it's worth a million dollars and they list it for $2 million, those people want to sell it in the slowest amount of time, but not for, but for way too much money. Okay. Get back on point. Okay, so Katya, do you have any idea when whatsoever when COVID is going to pass? That's a very good question. Thank you, Brett, for asking me. No, I don't. And that's why I'm talking to you now, because yeah. I want your professional advice. Great, yes. great. Uh, wonderful. I don't know either. So let me ask you this question. Now, that guys, this is going towards the motivation. Now, usually if I'm getting to this point, I should already know your motivation, right? Because this is more framed. Uh, more as a pre-qualification of the listing appointment or the listing appointment. Um, so I should already know this, but because this is role play, I'm going to ask it. So Katya, let me ask you this. Do you absolutely need to sell your home? Or if you didn't sell it, can you just stay and keep it? Yes, I could have that choice if I wanted to, but I am much more interested on in seeing a better outcome and selling my house now. Okay. So at this point, I would de dive deeper into that, right? Because uh, if you don't need to sell it, see right now, we want to focus on people who have to sell, not people who want to sell. People who want to sell want to list their property 20% over the market because they think that it's just, uh, we're, we're on SpaceX and we're going to Mars, right? That's what, that's what people who want to sell price their homes at. So I would have dived deeper into that, but for the sake of time and for the sake of this, this role play, I'm, I'm not going to dive too deep into that. Oh my gosh, we're running out. So we're just going to role play this out. Um, so Katya, what, um, is it okay if I share with you uh, a market insight uh, with you that, might, that you might find important that could change your position on waiting to sell your home? Is it okay if I do that? Yes, that will give me a lot of advantages of getting my mind frame and mindset to a different, uh, a different objective right now. Yes, absolutely. So look, Katya, most agents uh, would agree with you that you just need to wait out the COVID, right? Most agents would do that. I'm not most agents. See, now you're putting doubt in their mind. However, here's what I believe. I believe that that strategy is a gamble that could literally cost a homeowner tens of thousands of dollars. Do you mind if I explain? I would like for an explanation, Brett. Perfect. Thank you. So guys, look what I did there. I pre-framed the conversation that put doubt of what other agents are talking about and that most homeowners I deflected uh, are taking on a gamble of selling their home. Those are two things that you want to embed into that subconscious mind. Now, I'm not a fear monger. Right, I'm a realist. I, I'm I'm all about math. Um, so the next slide is uh, Katya. Did you know right now? Uh, or let's go over to you, Cecilia. Did you know that right now uh, that your home is worth more now than it ever has in the history of time and forever? Like if you sold it right now, it's never worth any more. Did you know that? Yes, Brad, that is the rumor through the grapevine, but yeah. I, I have not seen everything, anything written down. So yeah. I, am, I am listening. Okay, so I'm gonna make a note here to show you what the graph looks like over the last 10 years. And you're gonna be able to see, see this is an assumptive close. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you a graph after we talk here and you're gonna see a 10 year snapshot that right now, if you sell your home, you've sold it for more in the history of forever because as we know, 10 years ago, the homes at that time were worth more than they were 10 years prior, right? Yeah. So, uh, so what I'm saying, Katya, is if you sold your home right now, even if you gave someone a deal, which I'm not saying that you should, but even if you did, you have a 100% probability that you're going to sell your home for the very highest price than in the history of forever. Now, okay, here's what I did. Um, a lot of things I did on that. Uh, number one, 100% probability. I put that in there. Now you're, now you're starting to think things through uh, and that it's the highest price in the history of forever. A little bit of humor there, right? I'm not going to say 10 years. History of forever is kind of funny, depending on how you do it. Um, 
and then I, I go right into now, right? Pattern interrupt. Your brain, when I do that, knows I'm not finished talking. But if I don't throw in that now and, and, and express it, it's a run-on sentence. And now it feels uh, unawkward, unrehearsed, unnatural. Now, let's look at what would happen if we wait and how that reflects on the cell of your home. Let me go to the next slide. First, you said that you, your home, now I, I need to get you back into engagement with me. Now, first Katya, you said that you have to sell your home, right? Right. All right, so that's something that we have to consider. Second, now most people, deflection, most people would agree that when COVID passes is a variable, right? We don't know when that pass date is. After all, it's a virus. So some could say that it's never going to pass. I'm not a scientist, but I, I don't remember learning anything about the extinction of a virus that science has eradicated, right? So um, that's a really X. That could be a week. That could be a month. That could be a year. I think the fair assessment to say is it's not happening this year, right? A vaccine, right? Would you agree right. with that? Yes. Short term. Okay. Now, as far as what's going to happen after COVID is all an opinion. I have an opinion. Other people have an opinion. Uh, and there are really, 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 really smart people on both sides of the subject that are more smart than me and that are more experienced than me on the shape of the economy. Would you agree with that as well? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm keeping you engaged by asking these questions. Yeah. You're running out of time. It's 9.02. I just want to tell you. Okay, guys, this is going to be to be continued. Actually, I'm going to do three more minutes. Uh, on one side, you have people who think it's going to be sunshine and rainbows. On the other side, you have people who it's going to be the opposite of that. So here's the deal. Katya, do you want to take a 100% chance, a 100% probability that you're selling at the highest market in the quickest amount of time if it's safe? Or do you want to gamble a 50-50 odd that you're going to either A, probably sell it for the same amount as you could do now, or B, a 50% chance that you're going to chase the market down and it could perhaps cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Which no, one? Brad, I have to thank you. You have convinced me. I am going to look at the number and I definitely would like to lease my house. Thank awesome. you. You're doing a good job. Thank you. So that's it, guys. Um, I, I have a chat. I am late. I am sorry for running over. It's my own fault. I was going to go with five things. I turned it into 12. Um, but next Tuesday, if you guys show up here live again next Tuesday, uh, I'll, I'll make more time to, to actually go over your guys' objection handling. But I hope this helped you guys out. I hope yes, you have did. a fabulous Thursday. You know, focus yes, on listing. Well, you. you don't have a listing. Thank you. We're unemployed. So, you know, make it a great Thursday, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brett.